So over the last few weeks, I've told you a little bit about some of the DTRs that I've had with Coletta, the defining the relationship conversations. I haven't told you yet about probably the hardest DTR I've ever experienced, and that came after one of the best ones that I've ever had. That one that I told you about where she said, you know what, I, I think I can marry you. That was great. That was like the best DTR ever, because it wasn't necessarily what I was expecting, and, that, and that, that, wow, that hope that broke in, it was fantastic, and I was riding on a high, but I knew that I, I wasn't ready to ask her to marry me because I hadn't done what I, what I felt like was going to be a really important thing, and that is that I wanted to talk to her father. So I, I called him one afternoon, and I said, hey, uh, I wondered if I could talk to you tomorrow. You know, when you come home from school, could I just meet you at the house, and we could have a conversation? And it's one of those really long silences. And he... Frank, who's my father-in-law, he's, he's not a really loquacious person. He's not the kind of person from whom language just bubbles out anyway. So I wasn't immediately alarmed, but it, it seemed to go on for a really long time. And he said, well, yeah, I guess I'll be home about, you know, 4.30, so why don't you just come on over then? Which pretty much ruined the rest of that afternoon and evening and morning and the rest of that day. I, I was just tied up in knots, and I, and I went and I, and I sat down, and of course... Frank was on the other side of the table for me, and Claudia's mom, Linda, was right there. And uh, so I, you know, I, I did it. I, I asked if, if I could marry his daughter. I would tell you how I did that, but I have absolutely no recollection whatsoever. <laughs> so apparently, the right words eventually came out, though, because, because this happened. His, her mom went, oh, yes. And I was like, okay, one down. And I looked at him, and he was not quite as enthusiastic. In fact, he, he kind of he, he leaned on the table, closed his eyes, wouldn't look at me. And he said, well, I'm like, oh, well can go either direction, right? This could be really good, this could be really bad, and I don't know what's about to He goes, well... She's never come home crying because you treated her bad. Like, All right, that's, that goes on the good column. That's definitely a good one. He goes, and uh, I always told her she needed to finish college, and she's going to be finished college here in a few months. I'm like, I think that's a good one. Okay, put that in the good column. He goes, well, and you guys, you have a lot of stuff you like to do together. Yes. Then he just kind of trailed off. And then came the question that I was dreading. So, how are you going to take care of her? I was like, well, I'll be good to her. And I'll, he goes, no. Like, what are you planning on doing for a living? And at that point, I was like, oh, this is, this is not going to be. Because at that time, I, honestly, I didn't know. I had a sense of a call of God on my life, I, and I knew I was supposed to go into ministry. At the time, I thought it was music ministry. I told you that that was a little bit of what Claude and I were talking about, what she was figuring out. Could she handle that? Um, but like, that was like the two worst possible answers. I was, like, I was thinking I'd be a musician in ministry. Like, can you get a worse possible combination from the perspective of having a good, solid life income to draw on to take care of somebody's daughter? I mean, musician, is, it's a joke, Right? I mean, if a, dads, if, if a guy came to you and he said, hey, I'd like to marry your daughter and I plan on making a living as a musician, anybody go like, yeah! <laughs> of course not. That's not your dream for your child. And to make it worse, I added on it, well, I'm also going to be doing Christian music, <laughs> ministry, and probably having to raise support and ask people for money. And, and I didn't know this at the time, but afterwards, they talked to Coletta about what that meant. And at that point, my, my mother-in-law's enthusiasm tanked. <laughs> Coletta told me that she cried when she found out that's what we were heading towards. And, and obviously, they, they did say yes. It wasn't the resounding, enthusiastic yes I was hoping for, but, but I understood it because they liked me, but they didn't have a lot of confidence in what I was telling them I was headed towards. My goals in life were not what they were looking for. My goals in life didn't include security. They didn't include a large income. They didn't include a retirement home. They didn't include vacation houses and nice cars. They didn't include a lot of the stuff that the world tends to look at and go, that's your standard of success. That's your measure of whether or not you know you've made it in to the in crowd. And I wasn't looking for any of those things. 
And I'll be honest, it's not that I would dislike them. Sure, I would like to have a little bit more income. Sure, I'd like to have a nice IRA. I'd like to have a nice car. I, I don't. Actually, that's not true. I've, I've been in different parts of the world where people, just standards of cars are different than here. Compared to a lot of people in the world, I have a fantastic car. From a lot of your perspectives, it's a junker. The sun visors fell off years ago. The fuses started popping, so I realized that I had to get a hold of a couple of wires and pull them out of the hole where the sun visor used to be and wrap them up in tapes so they didn't touch each other because they did, it killed my electrical system. There's old concrete on the back seat. I don't even know how that happened. I blame my kids. It's, it's, it's not, oh, one of the windows. If you, if you go buy my car on your way out today, it's a black rodeo. The, the paint job's a mess. And you'll notice in a window there's a pair of pliers stuck there. That's because that window's broken. And if the pliers are not there, the window will call, come down all by itself. And then I have to get my children other pliers to help them pull it up. And then they have to hold it in place as we drive. It's not a great car, but you know what? It's been running for 15 years. And it gets me where I need to go, and I'm happy with that. But the point is that my standards of success were a little bit different than my wife's, and that made for a very difficult DTR. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know what your standards of success are. But one of the things that I continue to find surprising is that the world's standards of success are so radically different than God's standards of success. If you have your Bible, I'd love to ask you to turn with me this morning to the book of Matthew. In our survey of eight pivotal conversations with God, we're going to jump to the New Testament now. There's a lot more conversations we could talk about in the Old Testament. But we're going to move on. Last week we saw a conversation where God told Abraham, you want to know what name I should go by? You want to know the window that gives you some sense of who I am and whether or not I can give you everything that I've promised? I'll tell you who to call me. Call me I am. And that profound just but enigmatic and difficult to understand statement that he just drops on Abraham and on the Israelites. It's, it's not he can do this. It's not that he is this. It's just I am. He is before all things and he's after all things so that when we say I'm not strong enough, God says I am. When we say I'm not confident enough, God says I am. He's I am. But when we come to God and we begin to follow him, one of the things that has to begin to happen, if we're going to maintain that journey, if we're going to maintain that pursuit of God, is that we have to go through a reorientation of our values. Because what the world says, this is the standard of success, is not what God says. And I don't know of any place where that's made more clear than in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds... That is, there were large numbers of people who came to follow Jesus. They were fascinated by him. But what they were looking for is not necessarily what he was looking for. And so when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples, those closest to him, came and he began to teach them. And he said to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. They will be the ones to be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, my guess is you've probably heard some of this before, right? For how many of you, is this the first time you've ever heard what we call the Beatitudes? Okay, yeah, not many of you, and that's pretty common if you spend any time in church. This is a common set that's sort of, uh, you know, spoken. It's, it's very central to Jesus' event. We call this, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, and it seems to be a defining conversation. Uh, it's a defining the relationship. This is where Jesus brought his disciples and all those who were coming and, and crowding around and were looking for different things. But Jesus pulled his disciples and said, you can't be looking for the same things they're looking for. Because my standard of success is a little bit different. And here he laid out his standard of success. We, we call these the Beatitudes, and it's, it's from the Latin word for blessing. And, and this is actually not the first time we've seen this kind of teaching. In fact, this is a figure of speech. The Beatitudes are a particular figure of speech that we actually see in a lot of ancient literature. In fact, I'll, I'm going to read you this morning. In fact, if we can go ahead and put them up on the screen, I'll show you an example of, a, of another set of Beatitudes. These Beatitudes came from uh, Yahshua ben Sira. And if you'll notice, if we can go ahead and advance that to the next one, please. 
I want you to notice something as we go through these. Notice, number one, they have a very similar form to what we see Jesus speaking. And that's because Jesus was using a very common, familiar form. He usually used the the ways of speaking of his day so that he could communicate. He didn't invent new radical ways of communicating. But I want you to notice, in addition to this being very similar in some ways in terms of the form, I want you to notice the things that are different. Yahshua ben Sira said, there are nine things, nine people who come to mind as blessed. A tenth whom my tongue proclaims. Number one, the man who finds joy in his children and the one who lives to see the downfall of his enemies. That one's a little different than Jesus, but stick with me. (laughs) Blessed is the man who lives with a sensible woman. All right, fair enough. (laughs) And the one who does not plow with an ox and a donkey combined. That actually, that probably is part of a very typical Jewish saying. In fact, we may see it reflected later on when Paul says, do not be unequally yoked. He's probably drawing on this Jewish proverb It doesn't make sense to have two different animals because what's going to happen, you're going to go in a circle. So again, I mean, that one makes a fair amount of sense. Blessed is the one who does not sin with the tongue and the one who does not serve an inferior. Blessed is the one who finds a friend and the one who speaks to attentive ears. How great and how greatly blessed is the one who finds wisdom. But none is greater than the one who fears the Lord. Fear of the Lord surpasses all else. To whom can we compare the one who has it? So you notice that there's some similarities. Obviously, the the general form is the same. Blessed is is a very normal kind of a way that people would use these Beatitudes. But what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5 is a little bit different than this. And it happens on a couple of different levels. Number one, it happens on the level that it doesn't end the way everybody expects it to end. See, typically the Jewish Beatitudes ended the way that Yeshua ben Sirah's did. They end with something like, yeah, but all of those, as nice as those are, none of them compare to fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the most important And Jesus' Beatitudes don't end there. Or maybe they do. But maybe they end there in a different way. Just file that one away. We'll talk about that next week. The other thing that's different about Jesus' Beatitudes is that uh, Jesus explains them. Typically in a Beatitude from the ancient world, you don't explain it. I mean, blessed is the man who finds a sensible woman. Do you really need any more explanation? Like at that point, are you going, what in the world is that guy talking about? Sensible? Ugh, I don't want that. No, we understand it. They, they're, they're proverbial. They, they pick up on common sense kinds of things. And so they don't typically have an explanation, and yet Jesus in Matthew 5 explains each and every one of these, doesn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will. Each one of them has an explanation of because. And I think the reason for that is the second difference between Jesus' Beatitudes and the Beatitudes of the ancient world, and that is because Jesus' Beatitudes don't make any sense. They're bizarre. Blessed are the poor. You should understand, by the way, blessed here, it means happy. And I've heard different scholars over the years try to turn it into something else, like they will be blessed or they will eventually come. But that's not the normal usage of the word. This word for blessed literally means happy because of circumstances. This word is used hundreds of times in the Old and the New Testament. And in every instance, it speaks to the idea of these people are happy because of their circumstances. And that's precisely why this doesn't make any sense. Because here, Jesus is speaking about a set of circumstances that really don't make any sense at all. Poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who are hungry and thirsty. How does he mean that they're happy? And what I think he means is, listen, they are in a set of circumstances from which they are able to take hold of something far better than what the world is giving them. Everybody else would look at these things and say, these are not happy circumstances, these are quite bad. But what Jesus says is, yeah, but if you take the world standard, if you grab a hold of the things that the world offers you, your hands are full. And you cannot reach out and take hold of something that's far better that's being offered. So these people are actually happier. These people are blessed because their hands are open and they're able to take hold of something that blows all of the world's standards away. Some of this is easier to understand when we we see something about the way that this whole thing is structured. This whole thing is structured in such a way that you have two clear halves. And you can kind of see those halves on your own, can't you? The first four talk about things that clearly look like non-positives. Let's call them that, shall we? Maybe that's a little convoluted. 
The first four are clearly negatives, aren't I mean, poor and meek and hungry. Those are things that the world would say, those are negatives. The second set of four are a little bit more positive. There we begin to see the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Those are more positive, and so we see clear hats to this whole thing. But there's another piece to the structure that's important to understand, and that's this, that each one of the elements in the first half is matched up to an element in the second half. So that they're really two parts of the same whole. So what happens is the first element is matched up with the last element. They go together. They're supposed to be understood as a package. The second beatitude matches up with the next to last. And the third element with the next to next to last. And that's kind of hard for us to see because we don't think in those kinds of terms. There's a technical word for that form. It's called a chiasm where the first thing corresponds to the last, the second to the next to last. It's very common in ancient literature. We do them occasionally. We don't do them in large sets, but we say things like, um, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. See that country, do you, you, do country? The elements of the first half get reversed in the second half, but they're matched up in some significant way, and that's what's happening here. So, in fact, if you could go ahead and advance on, Andrew. What I want you to see this morning is that these things connect. Go ahead, one more, please. And one more. And one more. So the first and the last actually correspond with each other. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And you can see it just in the surface. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the last one, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That kingdom of heaven only occurs in the first and last one. It's part of the signaling. It's part of the way in the ancient world you would have told somebody, hey, watch out for this particular format. I want to let you know it's coming, and they give you something really obvious to make sure that you catch it. The other thing that we might miss in addition to the structure is that each of these things that Jesus says is connected to something in the Old Testament. And when we see the Old Testament background, what Jesus is saying here becomes quite a bit easier to grasp. So if you could advance it, Andrew. What Jesus is saying here is connected to a passage from the book of Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah 61. You can read it up there, or if you want to flip with me to it. We'll actually be in Isaiah for just a couple of different moments this morning because he refers to Isaiah 61 several times in the Beatitudes. But in Isaiah 61, God says, these are the words you're supposed to speak, Isaiah. And Isaiah says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is actually one of Jesus' favorite Old Testament quotes, and he uses it to identify his own ministry. This is, the, this is the quote that Jesus used when he went into the synagogue and they said, hey, you clearly sort of a, of a rising star in this whole religious field, so why don't you tell us what you're all about? Why don't you pick a passage and read for us that passage? This is the passage he wrote, read, read. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim good news. Good news to the who? To the poor. Now understand, the poor... Is, is a broad word in the ancient world. It, it can refer to those who didn't have financial wealth, but it was more connected to those who were oppressed and afflicted. That is, because of their lack of wealth, they didn't have position and privilege, they didn't have power, and they often didn't have rights in the courts, and they were trampled upon, and they were oppressed. And so the poor became a sort of a, a, of a you know, kind of a, a hanging word. It was the word that you hung this whole idea on, of somebody who was afflicted, somebody who was mistreated. And then you begin to see that here in the second half. Blessed are those who are persecuted, because the persecution is intimately connected to being poor in the ancient world. What Jesus says here is, these people are happy. How is that possible? Not only do they don't have wealth, but now you're saying that they were also persecuted. They were oppressed and they were afflicted. And the answer is yes, because. Because they didn't have things of the world to hold on to and because they didn't have things in the world to hold on to, they also didn't have things in the world that held on to them. They were free. And so when Jesus came and he said, the one that everybody's been waiting for is here, they could take hold of him. Right? Think about this. The first people that we see Jesus call, in Luke chapter 5, he's at the Sea of Galilee and he's got this 
thing going on with the fishermen and he raises all these fish and they catch them all and they're amazed and he says hey come with me and we'll go and we'll become fishers of men and they left everything and they followed him how much did they have to leave and the answer is not all that much because they were poor these were not commercial people. These were not people that had large stores of income and wealth. This is not who they were. They were able to leave everything. I remember Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, was talking about this thing. I saw, heard it recently. He goes, you know, they left everything. That's really impressive. But they, you know, they were fishermen. It's not like they were investment bankers. He said, you know, so Jesus said, hey, come with me and you have to leave everything. That's the catch. And they were like, okay, so we've got to leave the pole here. Now you can bring the pole. And I think it's very interesting, very secular comedian understands that these were not people with lots of holds on them. They weren't investment bankers. They didn't have all the good stuff. These are the people that Jesus called. These are the people who came. Yet at other points in Jesus' ministry, we see the exact opposite thing happening. The story of the rich young ruler that I think Luke directly contrasts with the story of the disciples much later in the gospel. He speaks of a man who had great wealth that came to Jesus, and Jesus said, leave everything and come with me. And the man went away sad because he had great wealth. He couldn't let go of it. The world would say he's happy, but Jesus says he's not happy because he can't have me. He's not able to take hold of me. He's not able to take hold of a much better thing that's being offered because the wealth that he thinks he has a hold on, in fact, has a hold on him. So it's got to be reversed, he says. If you want to come with me, you've got to understand that it's those who are poor who are going to be happiest because they're able to take hold of what Jesus has to offer. And he offers it. He has been anointed to proclaim good news to the afflicted, to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners. The second set, I'll go ahead and bring those up, Andrew. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that's connected to the next to last one. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. This one actually comes, go ahead and pass it on to the next part of Isaiah, from the, from the same chapter in Isaiah, just a couple of verses later. There, Isaiah said, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, and to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, and to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And you can obviously see the connections there to what Jesus said. He, he talked about, obviously, those who mourn, and Isaiah talked about mourning. But then what we see in Isaiah is that that mourning is going to be reversed. It's not going to stay that way. And as, as Isaiah goes on, he says, instead of tears, they'll have a crown of beauty, joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise. And all of these things are things that people either put on or they were given to them as part of a celebration. When a victory had been won or when the king was coming, these were the things that they used to dress themselves up. This was the way that they went about their process of celebration. And so what Jesus says here is that it's about to be reversed. Now, in some ways, the fact that he says, blessed are those who mourn, might seem contradictory. A few weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus was asked, why don't your disciples fast? And specifically, it was a fasting of mourning. And he said, they said, you know, the Pharisees fast in mourning, and the, the disciples of John the Baptist, they fast in mourning because we're waiting for God to come, and he hasn't come. And Jesus said, they can't fast in mourning. They can't mourn. The bridegroom is here. What you've been waiting for has come. So this isn't a contradiction here in Matthew 5. It's an anticipation. What he's saying is, blessed are all those who have been waiting for God to arrive. Because guess what? All the mourning is going to be turned to dancing. The ashes are going to be turned, turned to oils of gladness. All of the things that have caused you to mourn because you've been waiting are going to be turned around. They will be comforted. And comfort here has this idea that they will be given what they need. They will be given what they've longed for. And here again, we have this problem with the world standards because when the world says you need this and this and this and we get a hold of it, we don't feel like we need much else. I was talking to a group of pastors the other day and we were, we were agreeing that the, the middle class are probably the hardest people to do ministry to. And here's the reason. The poor 
know what they need. And the rich often have so much of what the world says you need that they recognize I'm still empty and I still need something that the world can't provide. The middle class is in this strange middle ground, though, where we have enough of it to go, I like this. We have enough of it for it to begin to get a hold of us. But we don't have so much of it that we fully understand the emptiness of it at the end of the day. And so we tend to think, if I just got a little bit what? Yeah, if I had just a little bit more, then I would be able to assuage the emptiness. If I had just a bit more of this, then I would be happy. And so Jesus says, no, 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 those who mourn, those who recognize their need, those who recognize they don't have what they've been longing for and that it can't be filled by the things of this world, they will be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. And that peacemakers, it's, it's an interesting phrase. And I think... What it's connected to is, is that part in, in Isaiah, and I don't know if you caught it, but he says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God. What he says is there's a day coming where God will bring vengeance. God will bring justice. And for those who have oppressed the poor and the weak and the downtrodden, they will get what's coming to them. But it will be God who does it. It will not be the poor. It will not be an uprising. It will not be something that happens in the courts. It will be something that God himself brings about. And here Jesus seems to be connected to that when he talks about peacemakers. He doesn't mean those who force their own way. He doesn't mean those who insist on their own agenda. He means those who rest in the knowledge that God will make right what needs to be made right. And they rely on God and his strength and his movement rather than their own efforts, than their own plans, than their own agendas. And I think that's connected. So as he goes on, he says, for they will be called children of God. And if you saw in Isaiah, it said they will be called oaks of righteousness. And clearly Jesus is making some kind of a, a connection, oaks of righteousness and children of God. And here's the thing, in the ancient world, and we see it several times throughout the book of Isaiah, oaks were a sign of the strength of Israel early in the book. Early in the book, the oaks were huge and they were massive and they were solid. And the Israelites looked at them and they said, look how great those are. We're just like that. We have so much power and we have so much ability. We have all the things that we need. And God says, beginning the book of Isaiah, all those oaks are coming down. Those things that you think give you strength, those things that give you some misguided sense of your sufficiency, no, they will be leveled. But now, when God comes, those who have longed for God and who receive him with joy, they are now called oaks. But they are oaks of righteousness. Those who stand firm on the word of God, those who insist on doing what is, re is right regardless of what the world says, regardless of what it costs them to do what is right in this world, those for whom righteousness is their guiding principle. God says, you will stand firm and I will lift you up and I will strengthen you and I will bring justice where it needs to be done. You don't trust in the things of this world, you trust in me. And so children of God and oaks of righteousness, those are the people that God is looking for. The third set, it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And that's connected to, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This actually, both of these are, are based on the Psalms, so if you want to flip back to Psalm chapter 37, you'll see the first of these. Psalm 37, it's the exact wording that Jesus is using. He says, but the meek will inherit the land. And the Hebrew for land is the same word as earth. So it's exactly what Jesus is saying. But the meek will inherit the land and therefore enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, meek is, is a word that in, in our English language, it, it connotes or it has this sense of a negative thing. The meek are the ones who, who get walked all over. The meek are the ones who, who never speak up. The meek are the ones who just, you know, they're, they're mousy. They're, they're, they're afraid. And, and that could be what's intended here, but the word for meek, both in Hebrew and Greek, has more to do with humility than it does with weakness. What he literally says here, the humble will inherit the earth. Which is very interesting because, of course, 
in our world, we don't value humility. In our world, we value looking out for number one, don't we? Those who go take what they want. That is, you know, fortune favors the bold. That's how our world operates. If you want to get anything, you've got to take it. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to search your will. You've got to dominate. You've got to get out there and you've got to make it happen. And Jesus here, going back to the psalm, says, no, that's not God's standard. God's standard is the exact opposite. It says those who are humble, those who don't assert their own way, those who don't insist on their own agenda, but they trust in the Lord, those will be the ones who will actually inherit the earth. And the second part, blessed are the pure in heart, that's actually from Psalm 24, if you flip back just a few pages from where you are in the Psalms right now. Verse 3 of Psalm 24, he says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive the blessing of the Lord and the vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him and who seek your face. And I don't think it's an accident. Remember, where is Jesus when he's speaking this to his disciples? He's on a mountain. And he refers back to this psalm, the, who can come up the mountain to meet with God? And the disciples are like, well, that would be us. And Jesus seems to say, yeah, as long as, as long as this is true of you, who can ascend? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now here, you begin to see something very interesting that's happening. The psalm was well known. Who can ascend to the mount of God, those who have pure hearts? And when they go up to the mountain of God, who do they meet with? Who's on top of the mountain of God? It's God. Now his disciples have ascended a mountain, and Jesus has called to mind this this psalm where you ascend the mountain, you meet with God, and they've come up, and they're like, well, who can ascend? That would be us. Yeah, I mean, I've got a pure heart. Do you have a pure heart? Well, yours is not quite as pure as mine, but, oh, that's right, that's not the humility thing. I mean, and they're struggling and they're working through that. But remember this idea, ultimately, because those who have pure in heart, they come and they meet with who? They meet with God, but who are they meeting with? They're meeting with Jesus. And we skip that. We don't, we don't see it. But for the disciples sitting there, who can ascend the mountain to meet with God? We have ascended the mountain and we're meeting with you. Wait a minute. Are you saying that, uh, and we'll just file that one away for next week. But yes, he is absolutely is and in fact understand this every one of his beatitudes speaks directly to the person of Jesus every single one of these speaks directly to who it is that Jesus is this is not just a list of ethics it's not just a list of behaviors we're supposed to follow it's a radical reorientation of the world's standards but it's a reorientation that we cannot accomplish on our own which is why It's not just about a reorientation of standards. It's also about pointing people to who Jesus is. Because what we're going to see time and time again as we come to next week's part of this DTR is that Jesus says all those things that I've said you're supposed to be that you're looking at me going, I can't pull that off. He goes, yeah, you can't. But if you come to me, I will pull that off in you. What you cannot accomplish on your own, I can accomplish in you and through you. Every one of these Beatitudes is about who Jesus is. This third set, fourth set. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This also goes back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 49. It says, they will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert high heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion, and the Hebrew for mercy and compassion are exactly the same. He who has mercy on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. So there we have the hunger and the thirst and the mercy. And here, Jesus' beatitude, he speaks of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will have it. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
world hungers and thirsts for a lot of different things. But righteousness is not high on the list. Have you ever heard somebody say, here's my plan for life. By the time I'm 35, I expect to have this job, and I expect to have this amount of income, and I expect to have a house and be this far along the mortgage. Oh, and I also expect to be thoroughly righteous. You ever heard that one? No, we ask people to, to lay out their, their goals, and, and that makes sense, because if you don't know where you're going, it's very hard to know if you're making any progress getting there. The problem is that the world's goals are fundamentally different than God's. And what God says is none of those things that the world says, these are your standards for success, count. Not at the end of the day. What the world hungers and thirsts for is not what I long for you to hunger and thirst for. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will have it. Now, i, I got to jump ahead really quickly. Look at verse 11. We're going to unpack this more next week. But he, Jesus there says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And what Jesus is saying there is essentially, in the last verse he said, if you're persecuted because of righteousness, you're blessed. And you're also blessed if you're persecuted because of me. And the reason that they're both the same is because righteousness and Jesus are the same thing. And I'll unpack this more next week, but you need to understand that it's part of this whole package of things. Jesus is not saying, I'm a good example of righteousness. He's not saying, look at me and you'll see what righteousness looks like. He's not saying, I can show you how it's done. What he's saying is, I am righteousness itself. I am the wellspring of righteousness. I am the source of all righteousness. And it's only in your relationship with me that you can ever be righteous. He's not saying he's an example. He's saying he's the very thing that they're supposed to hunger and thirst for. And they will be satisfied because he longs to give himself fully to those who want the right things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because that's exactly what God longs to pour out. In the person of Jesus, all of it is available to us. But there is a catch, and it's in that verse 7. He says, blessed are the merciful. In Isaiah 49, God is described as the one who is compassionate. He is the one full of compassion. And here's the thing. You cannot go to the compassionate one if you're not compassionate yourself. There's a fundamental mismatch at that point. And so there is a catch. God is available to pour righteousness into your life. And if that's what you come to hunger for, he will satisfy your hunger. If that is what you thirst for, he will slake your thirst for righteousness. He will pour himself fully into you and you will have everything that you long for. But there is that one condition. And that is, you have to be compassionate in the same way that he's compassionate. See, we're not righteous. On our own, we're not righteous. And so we have to go to a God who has to be compassionate before he can give us righteousness. We don't deserve it. He doesn't owe us to it. It is entirely because of his mercy that he gives us these things. And he says, if you're not merciful like I am, I'm not going to give you anything. I'm not. And I think it's intimately connected to what he begins this whole passage with. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit those who lack, those who are afflicted, those who are oppressed, and therefore know that they can take hold of what God has to offer. But those who insist on their own way, those who force their own way into others, those who long and hunger and thirst after things that the world says these are the standards, God says, fine, you have them. Go ahead and take hold of them, but you'll be left emptier than you began. When I was fairly new dad actually we decided to give our kids a really interesting experience we we're going to make our golden retriever have puppies and we did and just so you know they were insanely cute it was the craziest thing i mean i just my heart was like i don't even cry much but these puppies are so cute i almost have to weep it they were just it was crazy but there were 10 of them and our golden retriever was not that big and there was one really big golden retriever puppy we called her juggernaut She's just mad. She was twice the size of any of the other puppies. And it's very interesting that when the time would come, our golden retriever would lay down, and the puppies would just, like, rush from the yard. But I don't know if you know, like, dog anatomy, how many, like, places are there to get milk? Anybody? <laughs> I don't actually know. <laughs> but I know there weren't enough. <laughs> it was either eight or six or something like that. But here's the interesting thing. Like, juggernaut always got... I mean, and you could already be in place and Juggernaut would get in there, he'd push you aside. <laughs> no question about it. There was this one little puppy. 
the runt. And she could never get in. And it was interesting, it was like she didn't even try all that hard. Like they would rush and Juggernaut would push the other ones out and this one would come padding up and kind of look around like, huh. And then she'd go back to playing. It was interesting, she wasn't sad about it. She just sort of took contentment in whatever she had. But here was the very interesting thing, is that, and it happened very quickly, my kids fell in love with that little one. And so every time she couldn't get in, they'd go and they'd pick her up and they had a bottle and they fed her and she, they, and she would, and she was all by herself. She was laying in the crook of the arm and she just got as much as she wanted. So her little belly was swelled and she'd burp milk. It was so cute. And you'd set her down and she could hardly walk. She's like, okay. There was a ball here somewhere. And I, and I just, and I, and I realized over the years, it's such a very interesting picture the one who didn't assert its own will, the one who looked like from every other perspective and every standard wasn't getting enough, ended up with far more than she could take. She was fed till she was about to burst. And that's what God is saying here. This is what Jesus is saying to us here. The world's standards, you grab a hold of them and you're left empty. But if you will let Jesus reorient your thinking, reorient your heart, the world will look at you and go, well, you're missing everything you need. And you will go, what are you talking about? I can't take any more. It might help to drive home what Jesus is saying here if we think about the opposites of each of these Beatitudes. Instead of happy, think wretched. The first one is wretched are those who trust in the things of this world and who have it. And they think they have everything they need. They're wretched because they have no ability to take hold of the far greater joy that comes in Jesus. Wretched are those who are content with the things of this world and don't long for God to show up in their lives. He won't. And they would miss his coming even if he did. Wretched are those who insist on their own way and seek their own justice. Whatever they manage to achieve will be all that they have coming. Wretched are those who hunger for what the world offers. They will never be satisfied. Wretched are those who have no compassion for others. They will get no compassion from God. Wretched are those who look good on the outside but don't have God's heart. They'll never recognize God. Wretched are those who do not protect the weak when it's in their power to do so. They will be called the spineless. Wretched are those whose faith is so hidden that it attracts no attention from the outside world. They will get no attention from God. But if we can reverse them, we can in Jesus. Not on our own. It's not a matter of effort. It's not a matter of will. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of relationship. We'll unpack that next week. But if we allow Jesus to begin to change who we are, we will find ourselves in a position that even though the world says, you don't have anything you're supposed to have, we will go, I don't have room for anything else. I am full. I'm burping blessings. I know, that didn't sound spiritual, but you'll remember it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Let me end with three questions that I'd encourage you to think about this week. Can we go ahead and pop those up there? When I ask myself, how am I doing? And we need to ask ourselves that question regularly, but when we ask ourselves, how are you doing? What standards are you using? What standards do you tend to use? Just ask yourself the question, how am I doing? What's your immediate standard of judgment? And how do those standards compare to the standards that we see listed in the Beatitudes? It's a question worth pondering this week. Second question to ponder, when evaluating my life according to the standards put forward in the Beatitudes, where do I come out as okay? Because chances are you're going to look at some of those and go, actually, if this is my standard, I'm not doing so bad. And that's great. Be encouraged by that because it shows you that Jesus is at work in you. Take joy and comfort in that. But don't leave off the third question, which is, when evaluating my life according to the standards put forward in the Beatitudes, in what areas do I see the most need for change? Be encouraged with what God has already done in you, but don't think that he's done. What God has done is never all that he wants to do. And so be encouraged by where the places where you go, hey, I actually see God moving and he's changed me, but ask the next question and invite the Holy Spirit to speak and say, where do I still need change? Where do I still need transformation? In fact, let's ask God right now together to do that for us.